Good day, you're on uh, Fresh FM. This is Ben Vigin on the Deadline Reports. Um, today I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the whole overall picture of what's going on around the world, or in fact going around New Zealand in terms of these, you know, collectively. It's, it's, and what I want you to pay real attention here is I'm talking about not one individual thing, I'm talking about these things collectively, is the, uh, the attack on individual rights and the move towards... Uh, putting us in a situation where effectively only corporations have right. And, and, and it's very extremely orchestrated. Now, and there is another word for it. I mean, you know, it's, I've always turned around, when I turn around and talk about, you know, conspiracies, I've always said turn around and lean towards the fact that saying, well, most of all what drives what we would call conspiracies per se is the economics of the world which create an organic conspiracy which moves things towards centralisation of of power and wealth, and there isn't really twelve guys sitting around a table cracking their knuckles and going, <laughs> but this is this is what's going on here. When you look at the steps that have been taken, there is no room for leniency. What we're actually witnessing is a, effectively, it's a it's it's it is a global coup d'état. I know that's going to get me in trouble with lots and lots of people, but just bear with me and listen to what I have to say. Let's begin, we'll break the section into, like, we'll look at, and this is from, we're just going to try and keep this to New Zealand. Uh, we're going to look at, the first section is we're going to look at the issues of the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Then we're going to look at the current legislations of what's happening in our, in our, with our courts and constitutionally. And then the third part, what we'll actually turn around and do is we will look um at the various sort of mechanics that are actually taking place in terms of legal and and it's the it's the legislative and it's that legislative step which to me illustrates that you know whereas before and I, I always give the benefit down and say well no it's actually not you know this not 12 guys cracking the knuckles it's just the way the the, the economic system leans us towards the centralization this that legislative part is ex exceptionally different because you know you're showing deliberate intent uh, and, and it's quite and it's quite long uh, it goes back you know two or three decades so let's start with the first bit which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement which is e the easiest one out of all these things to go to go because it's one of the things ironically enough that nobody will actually contest when the TPA was put through uh, 2017 it drew out huge numbers of people they were extremely unified they were extremely solidified they understood that they were actually the uh, victims of an orchestrated plan by the corporate world, uh, which had been, you know, coming out of things before, even before the TPA, you had the, the Doha networks, you had Mike Moore's World Without Borders, uh, the WTO, which was this concentration area of basically a free trade grade, which just literally gave the capitalist world a free check. And everybody was in agreement with that. There was no uh, left or right, and, you know, it's it ultimately people got it. And, you know, people like... Uh, Mitura Tura, from the, uh, who was formerly the Greens Party, calling the Trans-Pacific Partnership a Magna Carta for corporations. And, and specifically, people like, you know, again, very, very respected by, by the left and, and by the right, people like Jane Kelsey uh, were pointing out the fact that things like the investment um, uh, settlements, uh, ISS, the investments, the investment state settlements disputes, yes, I got it. <laughs> That's one of the things that never sticks in my head. Um, that, you know, this, this was the purpose of allowing corporations to effectively uh, sue governments. And the highlight, of course, which was that the ISTSD would be um, government corporation would come here. Uh, they'd start mining. We might discover that they were actually polluting the rivers or doing something that was, you know, detrimental to the wider, um, you know, the rest of the, you know, the, the, the citizens. And the government might step and say, no, we're not going to let you do that. And then they could contest that. They felt that it was, you know, get rid of the, the right to make a profit, um, inter interfering with the, the, the commercial um, rights. And that's the key thing here. They, you know, it was about their commercial rights mattered more than your common rights, your more than your human common rights mattered. You know, their right, their right to put profits before pro, for uh, people's safety was considered to be the more important thing. So, in this event, it would go to a uh, a tribunal that would be held in New York and be um, overseen by New York's uh, state law. New York is a very unique place. It's like the United States, London. I think Rome, these are all places which are city places, but they are within themselves recognized as being nation states within, well, sorry, nations within a state, and they have 
um, you know, effectively their own sovereignty. And so in this situation, you'd be going to a, a New York-based tribunal, which would be overseen by uh, one end, the government would be the defendant, because they would be the ones being sued by the corporation, the other one would be the corporation, and then you get a, a tribunal or a troika, and that troika would be largely made up of people that were largely um, sympathetic towards corporate goals. So you were going into to a kangaroo court where the odds were two against one, that's never going to end, end well. That was how their investment state settlements were to be um, enacted. The Prior to the signing of the TPPA, the, the North American First Nation people contested that, and they, they made uh, a, a little bit of a success, and so has the, uh, the, the um, our indigenous um, people of the, of the Maori that have turned around and contested components of the TPPA uh, and Article 2 of the treaty. And then that's, that's kind of a really important thing, which I've covered in other shows, but it shows you that it can be stopped, but... It, it didn't really stop them, it just slowed them down because they changed the paperwork a bit. But as Jane Kelsey turned around and said, well, those ISSDs, those sort of investment uh, state settlements dispute clauses, still remain in actions and gave uh, corporates effectively power over the, of the law of the land. So things such as our common rights were actually deemed to be secondary to these tribunals. And that's basically, it was the very first alarm bell that we were actually ringing. And it said literally thousands and thousands of people actually went out uh, into, these, into these protests. Uh, they were made aware by people like Jane Kelsey, Mr. Atura. I myself turned around and, and you know, turned around and, and made, you know, did my efforts to turn around and said, wait a minute, guys, don't don't get fooled into thinking that a look party is going to, you know, they're going to side with you because at the end of the day, the TPA was actually pushed largely both by Labour and National and New Zealand First. And effectively, most of the the, the the political parties uh in in uh parliament have in one way or another been uh in in, in on this uh, whether even it's by not really saying something until after the event um you know silence is is complicity as well as they say so that takes us to the first section of this show that I'm doing about power and the orchestrated uh, coup d'etat global coup d'etat um We'll take a little bit of a break. I'm trying to think of a song that would actually, I think, will actually go with uh, the, the, the 51st state of the USA because ultimately the day, what's really driving these, these, these corporations is, you know, that it's, it, I mean, it's beyond states, but we're looking at predominantly US-dominated uh, states that are behind this, and they're working quite often in conjunction with the military-industrial complex. Uh, and one day, I suppose, we should actually do a story about looking at where China and America, you know, steps in because there sometimes appears to be a cold war but other times they actually seem to be quite supportive of that and, that, and that's probably worth the topic but today we'll just stick with the 51st state of the usa and we'll take a little bit of break so for those of you that are watching me on youtube the, or in fact for those who are not watching me on youtube um, you're back to the second part of the show. This is Fresh FM's The Deadline Report with Ben Bitchin Investigates. We're talking about the centralisation of power and the deliberate uh, moves towards effectively a... There is no other way to put it. It's global It's global dictatorship. Now, the in the first section, we talked about um, the TPA. Now, what we're going to turn around and talk a little bit about is the... Some of the other things that's sort of going on, because, you know, what we've actually witnessed um, in New Zealand is uh, things like, for example, uh, we'll look at the constitutionality of it all. So in, in 19, we'll try and keep this simple and base, but before even, in the 1984, Helen Clark, who, oh, at that stage, was a correction, in 1984, the Labour government, which was best known as being, you know, having taken an economic right turn. And there is a, a, a wonderful documentary, which I recommend for everybody to actually to watch. I mean, I share it probably at least once a month because it's, it has such a profound impact on me. It's called Someone Else's Country. And it kind of looks at the whole thing, the whole idea that national and labour, that that's kind of a bit of an illusion when you really understand the history of, of what's actually happened in terms of the uh, influence of multinational lobbyists moving to this country and effectively hijacking our political system. But marked most, of course, in the 1980s when Labour did its turn around and did its right-wing turn uh, and started to embrace the free market, so it believed that it could do this trickle-down effect. You know, you know, very much a close relationship with people like Faye Rich Whites, uh, the people that bought in the America's Cup, and the Labour Party, and with people like Mike Moore. And then Labour turned around and they 
uh, they first of all, they start the board of the Constitutional Act in, and that was in 1984. And they did it in a way where they just didn't ask for a referendum, they didn't do it by majority, they just went ahead and did it. Now, if you look at 1975, Fitzgerald versus Muldoon, and that case has just been used very recently, and again, it's been, you know, both cases, the justice said no, um, governments can't go around making legal fictions, but effectively, this is what our parliament did. They, they ignored the 1975 ruling that even the government must follow the, 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 the law of the land. You know, that's the whole point of habeas corpus article 29, is that we are all equal in the eyes of the law. No, Helen Clark, well, sorry, I wanted to get to Helen Clark, we'll get to her, but the Labour, fourth Labour government turned around and just turned around and did it. Justice Cook uh, reviewed that, turned around and said, well, no, you can't do this. And he was quite surprised that nobody in the New Zealand public actually was aware of this. But again, if you if you follow some of my uh, documentaries uh, on my line, website and, and uh, even on the show, you know, I show very clearly about how different legislative acts have been actually knocked out. Um, how different takeovers so basically meant that we've ended up with a very centralized media as well quite often owned by uh, you know offshore u.s interests we make a lot of noise about the chinese foreign influence in new zealand which is not to be disputed but we also remain exceptionally silent on the fact there are other ngos and other countries that actually also have done this so our media got very silent so we didn't really say a lot we didn't protest against this and, and we thought oh well you know we we trust our politicians i mean they might be dicks but you know it's not like they're even going to take away our rights <laughs> So that's it, you know, kind of went along. And then 1986 was followed up a little bit further, the 1990 Bill of Rights. And the 1990 Bill of Rights went on what was being built in 1986, which basically meant that parliamentary was supreme. It couldn't be challenged by, uh, by the courts, which was, you know, our opportunity to challenge uh, the parliament and, and do so under the habeas corpus article 29, which was basically we the people being the equal peers, being able to turn around and call even our parliament into action, well, that was actually cut. And so instead we had the 1990 Bill of Rights, which uh, basically turned around and said, well, actually only parliament's got the power and best thing that court can do is can call out a declaration of inconsistency, but that's all they can actually turn around and do. That's actually been followed through right now at the moment. Um, and Andrew Little is sort of pushing for the thing that they should have. Oh, yes, no, it's very important to have a declaration of inconsistency. Oh, terrible, terrible, terrible. You know, our, our justice system is actually particularly broke. And he's brought in a review, and he's brought in a review by the United Nations. And the review will be overseen by uh, Iran, uh, you know, to judge New Zealand's justice system. Iran that's hung 6,000 homosexuals. It'll be, uh, it, there's a whole review. There's actually three on it, which I think it's, it's, it's off the top of my head. I think it's Iran, Czechoslovakia, and Brazil. Um, Brazil doesn't have a particularly great human rights record. Czechoslovakia is not so bad, but then you start to look into the overall review panel, and it's made up of countries like Qatar, which has financed terrorism. It's made up of countries like the the Emirates, who of course you know sponsor Team New Zealand, uh, but of course the Prime Minister of Air Emirates, uh, sorry, the Prime Minister of the Emirates, who's also the CEO of the Emirates, also was discovered to have kidnapped his daughters, uh, one at the off, off the high sea using commandos, and the other one uh, off the streets of England. Um, brought them back to the Emirates and, um, you know, basically put them in their house of imprisonment. So this is the person that's going to be, you know, one of the people that's been guiding us on our justice of the human rights. But the striker would be actually overseeing things. Of course, they'll be underdoing it by uh, utilising New York state law. <laughs> Does that sound familiar, TPA, New York state law? Yeah, okay. So, of course, that's only come up recently because um, that whole process is what... what, what uh, has been put for the review, but the whole process is there that Christopher Favoya has also turned around and put declarations, a bill for the declarations of inconsistency uh, to take place. And when you read it, it's only when you read right into the Act of, uh, I think it's, I think it's 92J that you realise that you've actually got to read the 1993 Bill of Rights. So I said before, and I might, you know, I said I'd break this up into three parts. So I'm, I might actually lie and, and, and bounce around, but the point is, by doing that particular sort of thing, it kind of demonstrates to you that uh, that's kind of been done kind of inten intentional. So in fact, fact, part three, what we'll probably actually make is we'll make a little bit more about Christopher Foy and about some of the other things that have actually been happening. And I have spoken about this, so there might be double up on shows that I've done before him, but I think you know it's very important that we do cover these issues. So uh, that was pretty much one of the steps. So then in 2004, the next step they had, uh, the next step of this process was that they turned around and they got rid of the Supreme Court and they replaced it with, uh, sorry, they got rid of the Privy Council 
and they replaced it when they made the Supreme Court, the highest court, and the land. Now, step one, the Privy Council used to be made up of a series of Lord Lords in England that would review things from a constitutional viewpoint. And we actually look at Fitzgerald versus Muldoon that's actually taken place in England recently. It kind of is another demonstration of that that system actually did actually work. And it's also, you know, pretty much with the Commonwealth rights have been the thing that have actually protected the First Nation, allowed the First Nation some degree of defence in Canada, and it's providing the Maori people in New Zealand by the Article 2 additional defence. So the Commonwealth system has actually worked very well in protecting Indigenous rights, uh, but this is kind of what they want to, you know, do away with. So they got rid of, well, they didn't actually get rid of the Privy Council because they just shelved it because, again, that was a, they couldn't really get rid of it because if you actually look at the way that the acts are actually intended, which were written quite a long time ago, they actually were future-proofed to stop us from any form of tyranny from coming along and actually doing that. So what they've done is the second best thing is they've just parked it quietly to the side. They've replaced all the privy councillors. That's It's been made up of people like Winston Peters, who's also a serving politician. So, you know, I didn't look at you, how you look at how people like, you know, get done for, well, judges can't do a conflict of interest. They can't take on both clients. And yet this is what Winston Peters is doing. He's serving as an MP, but he's also been a privy councillor. It's got Helen Clark on there, who of course has pushed a lot of these, uh, you know, these uh, neoliberalism reforms. She's done so as the uh, Secretary of the United Nations of the Development, uh, UNTP. And it's got uh, people like Jenny Shipley, who of course we know all about her, you know, her role in Main and how she's sort of shown to have been quite greedy. And I think it's got Graham Latimer, who of course is also uh, uh, on on that sort of being done for being, you know. Greedy as a, as a director. Um, it's got Jeffrey Palmer, who flip-flops, who's basically a Labour MP. So basically, when you actually look at it, it's got the inner core of the National Labour people that have actually worked very, very closely with things like the TPPA to advance the centralisation of power for these people who obviously know better than us and, and we should just do as we say and, and not kind of look at the fact that their own record is pretty shonky, you know, at the end of the day. Um, of course, Helen Clark also has turned around and pushed for the uh, through the Helen Clark Foundation, has pushed for the Christchurch call for the greater censorship online. And that, uh, of course, has been done with the financing of people like the Emirates, who are also, um, you know, one of the people that are involved in the Troika of dismantling New Zealand's justice system. And it's done so with the backing of, of Qatar. And it's done so with the backing of the CEO of PayPal. And the guy from PayPal is quite an interesting character because on one level he's financed people like Nikki Hager and the um, Pandora Papers that expose all this dirty, rotten corruption, you know, Panama Papers, Julian Assange style. But not really, because when you actually look into it, what he's done is that he's only released a fraction of those documents, unlike Julian Assange, who nobody ever talks about anymore from the left or the right, you know, which shows you, you know, you know they're, both, they're, they're both dancing to the same string as far as I can make out. So they just release these documents very, very, very selectively, and they're really just using them to knock out the competition. Professor Mike West from Sydney University highlights the fact that um, basically they're really only going after Team B, while Team A, Deloitte's, uh, KPMG, all these other people that have also, and the big American corporations behind the TPPA, have largely been given a clean state of bill, and, and they don't get touched by these uh, papers as all these people run out and make themselves look like they're great independent investigative journalists. So don't get me wrong, I like Nikki, and we have a very good relationship. Uh, but that is the reality that, you know, there, there is, appears to be in journalism these days only two types of people, those who get their funding from the left and there are those who get their funding from the right. Uh, and then there, there's the lone unicorns like me uh, who we don't get funding from anybody because we're actually trying to point out the fact that this is all a big, you know, it's, it's a sausage chisel. There's a left wing prong and a right wing prong and you're the sausage and both sides are getting played like mad. Um I think on that note, I think we will play Why Can't We Be Friends? And you have said you're listening to the Deadline Report, Ben Vigin on Fresh FM, and we'll take a little bit of a break. So, again, part three, um, we will turn around and basically I'll just kind of get into some of these other things and sort of looking at the orchestrated level of it, and which I sort of think I've already done that to begin with, and also explain a few things like, uh, things like Christopher Foy, so you know I'm kind of reading the right direction, but so we we see that the next step, of course, is that we now have the I've already told you about the uh, Christchurch call, which was you know one of the things to censor the internet. Um, I talked about the that it was funded by eBay, who's also funded people like Edward Snowden, very good, very good journalists, uh, and the Intercept, and I, I don't think um, Edward Snowden has actually been delusional by this at all. I think he's actually one of the few ones that 
Yeah, he actually is walking around with only one eye, left eye open and right eye open. He's got both eyes open. Uh, but the people that funded it, of course, he went out and funded, also funded uh, Edward Snowden's boss and a whole bunch of neoconservatives. And it's a little bit like when you when you notice the yep, the billionaire boats that arrived in New Zealand during the lockdown and the, and the, the, the Lear jets that arriving. On one level, uh, you had a lot of these left-wing liberal, you know, that's how they've come to you know, promote or, or market themselves, I think is probably the better word or the more honest word. You had Jeff Bezos, you had um, one of the guys from Google, I think Larry Sergi, who spoke the censors. Um, and you had uh, the the people like the Murdoch, um, three boats from the Murdoch media empire were there. Murdoch's are interesting guys because the younger Murdochs play the climate change and the liberal uh, diversification model. Murdoch Senior plays the uh, right-wing curmudgeon, so they've got a, a foot in both camps, which is pretty much what was actually happening there because, of course, one of the other boats there was uh, you had you had um, Gale Force, which is, uh, I can't even pronounce the guy's name, Whale, Wayne Luthier, uh, but Wayne is also runs, a, he's involved in an energy company, so these are all tech companies, all mining companies. Michael Hill was there as well. And the um, the tech guys were from their own Gale Force, were also people that had funded Donald Trump uh, and people linked him with Stephen Brandon, who can be funny, found running around financing a lot of the New Zealand-style QAnon by people like Kelvin Alps being outed as links to Stephen Brandon, which I've worked a little bit with Nikki Hagen on those issues. Um, so we turn around and see that basically you know, it, both of them were working very well. Of course, the interesting kind of thing about the Patriotic Fund, I think it was actually called, which is the one that Wayne Lafayette was involved with, uh, but that was also tied up with the Koch brothers who were in bed with George Soros. And George Soros, they were doing a thing uh, which was, you know, but supposedly meant to be about never-ending wars. But it's quite funny because, of course, Koch brothers are the, you know, the, the one that the, the far left go out to demonise and George Soros is the one that the far right go to go out together. But when you actually look at that particular alliance, they were working quite nicely, which is, again, what you're seeing happening at the viaduct. So they're playing the far left and they're playing the far right. So, you know, the end result is that... Um, there were a lot of sort of military industrial complex people involved in this eBay people who were pushing these laws for censorship. And of course, Chris Fafoya has also been in there. He's involved also in the amalgamation of the TV and Zeta New Zealand into uh, one entire chapter. We're probably looking at another further step of centralization towards media. During COVID, 450 journalists uh, lost their job. 110 got to have their jobs back. Um, of course, depending on the fact that they wrote stories that were consistent with what the, what the government wanted. Um, we know that community radio is also under these same pressures. They've got to do what they have to do, so I don't hold any umbrage to it. But it is, of course, you know, I I myself, because of those confrains, have to be very pull my punches, which I'm okay with, but that's the pressures that we're actually being put upon. But 450, and of course, outside of this channel, I don't pull my punches, but I respect the, the platform I'm, I'm on, so that's where we are. 450 journalists got lost a job, 110 got to apply back for their jobs, so that's, you know, one of the things that Chris Fafafoy is doing. I've already told you what he's doing with the Declaration of Inconsistency. And, of course, now we also see he's introducing these hate speech laws. Um, the way that those hate speech rule laws rule work is that, you know, if somebody says something nasty more on issue on social media, but it's also going to be extended out to newspaper and media. Uh, they can make a complaint to the Human Rights Commission, which will go kind of through that uh, new end channel, which will link us back to the Troika, the New York Troika, which is also controlling the... Um, TPPA and the Human Rights Commission will end up sending out an automatic fine which you won't be able to contest like a parking ticket where you can but it'll be a huge hassle so it'll be just easy to pay the fine and so one of the tenets of the right to defend yourself again habeas corpus article 29 will again be kicked into touch as busily what we're seeing around the world is effectively what they're doing is they're pulling away uh, the common the, you know those those common law rights because the key thing about all those common law rights, and especially when we look at New Zealand, is that the, the English statutes talk about directly about the interval rights of the citizen. And this is this is what's been taken away. Individual rights have been taken away while the corporations have been empowered. So, of course, you know, we're looking at this again in terms of the Murray Award and uh, uh, He Puayana. I am actually taking, by the way, for everyone's interested, I am actually taking little Tirio Murray lessons at the moment. I'm, I'm going very, very slowly because I tend to mangle the English language as well as the Murray language. Uh, being dyslexic, but I am making my best. But these are the laws that basically have been uh, policies that have been rolled out of the Constitutional Advisory Panel, which was put in place in 2010 uh, under the uh, Māori Party and the National Party for put work together. Um, that actually obviously saw the Māori Party 
um, Luz get kicked out of Parliament for a basic term because a lot of Maori people stopped voting for the Maori Party because they felt they'd been sold, you know, being sold away. Um, but they put in this thing saying basically it's constitutional advisory, which made no mention of the English statutes, the ones that protect, you know, individual rights. It only talked about the rights of uh, basically of ting of ting tikianga tikianga, which is customary rights, which have been as explained to you. Uh, you know, they've made a little bit of a mistake here for themselves, which is a good thing, and it really is um, for all of us. But it, it, it's the customary rights which have been recognised under the course I told you about the TPA with the First Nation people of Canada uh, that have also recognised that they've been able to use that to slow down the TPA here in New Zealand. Uh, so they talk about the customary rights, but they only recognise it in terms of the Rangatira, which is the chiefs of what uh, Peter Sharples referred to as the Incorporated Society of Maranam. So he's talking about the Incorporated Iwi Boards. Uh, however, Mirama Broughton of the Murray Law Review turns around and said, wait a minute, you didn't make any reference here to the power of hapu and the power of uh, Fanu, which are themselves nations as recognised again by um, the United Nations. And, and again, you know, for example, you have the uh, American Indian Confederacy, also those tribes within the American Indian Confederacy are both nations. So they're not nation states, they're nations. But as we see under the treaty, signing of the Treaty Article 2, along with the Declaration of Nationhood 1835, along with the acceptance of, of Magna Carta rule, um, brings, which gives us protection of habeas corpus, that we were actually given these rights. So that's where we're at. And they want to do away with all of those common rights and only have rights for the corporations. And, of course, when you turn around and you look at a lot of the people that are within these political parties that have been doing these sort of things since 1986 or probably even earlier than that, uh, you will come across an organisation called the Parliamentarians for Global Action, previously known as Parliamentarians for New World, and it basically talks about centralised currency, central world government, and that all sounds okay if you actually really believe that that the UN is going to actually work with an idea of these inalienable rights. But what you actually even look at when you look at the United Nations uh, is that those inalienable rights have been actually taken away as well. So now they just have the rights as decided by the Troika, the New York State one, which are, tend to be the rights which are siding with the oligarchs, so it, it's basically ruled by the few over the many on the idea that these people somehow know better than you and I, and yet their own human rights record, when we look at the Sustainable Development Partners for the United Nations, which has become an incredibly privatised, Bayer, you know, former collaborators of the Nazi Party, Monsanto, Shell, you know, it's got a list of, of uh, Nestle's who want to privatise water, the, the list goes on, Coca-Cola, the list goes on and on of people that are just, you know, we grew up as all the people that protested against the TPPA very early on the peace turned around and said, no, 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 no. And now we seem to have completely forgotten about this as we're divided, polarised left and right. And by these oligarchs that are funding the far left and they're funding the far right and they're funding us to fight each other while they actually get it all. And it's that's basically, you know, what's actually going on. So there you are, boys and girls. That's why I'm saying that this is not the, the organic model. This is actually very, very deliberately, and this has been very, very well thought out, and it's an incredibly sophisticated media machine. And um, I don't know what to do about it because, you know, the reality is I've been trying to keep neutral and be a journalist as long as I can, be independent, not political affiliated. My funding's getting cut more and more. I'm basically on the bones of my ass. I'm I'm broke as fuck. I don't know how long I'm going to go, I'll go be able to go on for. And most of my platforms have been removed from me for the crimes of actually just trying to be not take money from anyone and just try and see both sides of the story and give you the facts so that you yourselves can determine what's going on. This has been Vision Reporting on the deadline, uh, the deadline report, courtesy of Fresh FM. Thank you very, very much to all of the people at Fresh FM. Uh, we're going into 20, obviously we'll probably be hearing this in 2022, so stay safe and look after each other. Uh, we are in tough times, and I, I've never seen anything like this. And to be quite honest, it really is actually breaking my heart. And I didn't never thought it would happen to. I never thought it would happen to New Zealand. Take care.